What's up, everyone? This is the Go Long Podcast. Coming to you live here from Boston, New York. Windy Boston. We're taking a risk recording this outside. Uh, but it was too nice out. The kids are down for their naps. We have to speak loudly when we're talking about the quarterback class of 2023. So, you know, you kind of weigh out all the different factors. I figured I'd uh, pod from the deck, Jim. And you're at home, not too far from me. But how in the hell are you? Good, good. I, I, I like the emergency podcast. I mean, we have to... <laughs> I mean, everybody's dying to know what is happening with these quarterbacks and where do you turn? Go long. And I love it. We're fueled by though every day, every morning, fueled by fatty, fatty beer company deals galore for your IPA, sour, wheat, Pilsner, any type of beer you could need seasonal. It's getting a little nicer. Good to bust out the sours. Uh, get on into Fatty Beer Company, and we're going to be there again Wednesday, this Wednesday, 6 p.m. to question mark. We'll see how many people show up, how long people want to hang out, but we'll be there on the eve of the draft to talk okay. about the Bills, Packers, Giants, Lions, Bengals. We cover the whole league, so anything you want. The quarterbacks. Jim is going to buy everybody's first round. First round of Fatty. Because he's just a hell of a guy. Florida. Sponsored by Florida Atlantic, uh, first round on Saturday. <laughs> so I'm very happy and very happy about that. Still very happy about that. It just it just speaks to the size of your heart, though, Jim. I mean, you're 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 winning big in March Madness, and you're just spreading the wealth around to uh, our Go Long subscribers. So very nice of you. People need to benefit from the hard work that goes on behind yeah. the scenes at Go Long. So you were just grinding that mid-major film. You knew Florida Atlantic As you know, was going to bring the goods. You're, you've you've dabbled, and you're you're into the NBA playoffs a little bit. And that's hey, Denver, nice call. But I was a coward last night, though. I I, I again five you, times at least. I've I've had the bet placed in the app, and I'm laying in bed and I'm tired. Can't do it. And I don't and I and I don't punch it through. And I know Once everybody probably says it. that. Yeah, it's part of it. It is part of yeah. it. Once you realize, once you realize, make your decision, and once it tips, out of your control. Should do you think we can bring in some of those Lions players to break down what they were up to? When you want to, let's. You know what? That's something we could talk about today if you want to. I, I have some feelings on that, but I don't know if that's the lead. We can get into that. Yeah, it's hypocrisy. It's gross. It's disgusting. It, Tyler, the league is trying to like play dirty. It's like they're hanging with hanging with the mobsters in the movie. Yet, oh no, 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 we're not friends. I don't know who that is. It's gonna happen. It probably happens way more than we even know about. Tyler, I can I can do this. Is the best way I can sum this up. It would be like anybody walking into work with an open can of your favorite beer, Miller High Life, probably puffing on whatever you like to smoke, you're blatantly telling your employer, I don't care. And when you get caught gambling, that's how hard it is to get caught gambling. You have to basically show up drinking and getting high in front of your employer to get caught gambling. They know the rules. They have been talked to by the NFL. And it's not fair, but they know the rules. And I don't have sympathy for those guys, but here's what I will say. All these players are gambling on the NFL, I promise you, but they're not affecting the games. And the reason the NFL has to crack down is because it will affect it will affect the public perception on what's going on in the NFL if these players are gambling. And and they have to they have to. The players know the rules. They were gambling on college football, whatever sport they were gambling on, but they were placing the bet from the facility. Those are the guys that got. You know, uh, I think they got the slap on the wrist or something. But the guys that were betting on the NFL, they're the ones that got the heave ho. And they should. They weren't affecting the game. They didn't know the rule or they knew the rule and ignored it. And they should be they should be fired basically from your job if you're ignoring a rule of your employer. That's how I look at it. I don't disagree with any of that, Jim. But you're point, right. There's a lot of idiotic point. rules that we have to follow and are riddled in hypocrisy. I get it. That's the hard part. That's Tyler, life. The stadiums, the New Orleans is sponsored by Caesar Sportsbook. The, the dome is now the Caesars Louisiana Sports Dome. You know, the Arizona Cardinals, 
who we can get into too. I have my new least favorite head coach in the NFL. Um, yeah, we'll get into that guy. Okay. But, yeah, you texted me that the other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, I'm good on him. Um, that that and they did some fact check, fact checking on his uh, statement. Oh, wrong man. on everything. And um, but my point is, as a gambler, and I, and you, I, and we've talked about gambling on this show with. I know players gamble in the NFL. We all do. You do. I do. You don't have to work in the NFL to know guys gamble. But to blatantly disrespect what your employer is asking you to do, they're not asking you to stop gambling. They're saying don't do it. Like they're just saying don't get caught doing it. Have your have your best friend do it. It's that simple. It can't be in your name. That's all. Well, it's even with Uber, with Lyft, with Teams, employing people who are their sole existence is to drive you home. If you're drunk, even with all of that in place, people still get DUIs in the NFL, right? They still screw up. So it's going to happen. I it's the hypocrisy drives me nuts. And that's, that's another story. But to your point on the NFL needing to, you know, throw the hammer down. I totally agree. I I think that the, the public trust is such a fragile thing and we wrote about it last year and it just we we haven't we haven't been in this world in a while where players are getting suspended for gambling but i can't recommend america's game enough by michael mccambridge amazing book that takes pro football all the way back to its roots in the 40s and the 50s and in the 60s when paul horning and alex Karras were tied up into some gambling themselves like pete rosell knew how important it was to punish them severely, to send a message because how easily we forget gambling was so embedded into many pro sports then, you know, boxing, uh, baseball, the Black Sox scandal. It just, it, it was a kind of a novel concept, but you had players out there getting had. Mobsters getting to these guys way, way back when. So you had the public wasn't really sure what to make of the NFL and pro football. Like, is this is this pure what I'm watching? Is is this outcome really this this the the, the purity of athletic competition where nobody's getting to them? It was very fragile then. I'm not saying it's that fragile now, but the public needs to believe that they're really watching team a versus team B with zero influence, especially now that all you have to do is pull up your phone and right there next to Instagram and Twitter and Facebook is an app for Caesars or FanDuel. And you can bet at any time anybody can. So I, I get it. Like Tyler, it, they it had to do to this go any further than how big betting on the NFL draft has become. You wouldn't believe what's going on in Vegas right now as far as the sports books. Those odds switch daily. Like they are doing serious, serious, as much research as they can on this draft. And people love gambling on the draft. And that tells you everything. If you like gambling on the draft, you know what's going on during games. Man, I want to talk about gambling with you. For that's a long, for, long yeah, time that here. Because, that's I mean, cool. that's where it gets interesting. If you get into draft pick bets, prop bets, this is going to happen on this specific play. You can't tell me that there's not a 22-year-old kid on a team that is putting two and two together that knows he could make a hell of a lot of money. You know, Maybe he's on a minimum contract. I know you're, you're rolling your eyes. No, I'm rolling my eyes because it's possible, Tyler. I'm, I'm more saying I want to believe – I want to believe that – it won't happen. I, what I'd like to know, Tyler, back to that Paul Horning story about what the what they were like. I don't know how much those players were salary wise, money what they were making back then. And I think those guys were tempted to get extra money, however they could possibly. I'm I'm I'm, I'm more assuming. I don't know. I don't know if it was all relative. Like, what did they make compared to what were they trying to get from the gambling world? Right now, what the hell would any starter in the NFL, what would any player on an active roster, he, they're, not, they're making too much money to risk gambling. Like, right. that, that's, that's, the, that's the honest truth. All right. Yeah. I'm tired of talking about gambling. Let's talk Same. about the draft. <laughs> Let's do it. So, yeah, Bob McGinn, 
at Go Long with his draft series, 39th annual, bringing it, as always. The guy is, I can't even begin to describe how hard Bob works on this series. He's turning these stories in at 3, 4 a.m. He has been talking to these scouts, these personnel execs, nonstop for several months. He wants to give everybody the good, the bad, the ugly, the unvarnished, unfiltered reflection of how the NFL is viewing these prospects. And as we've gotten into, these are relationships that have really been developed over time. So what made news yesterday, in case you missed it, was the S2 test, which honestly, I knew next to nothing about Jim. We've known a lot about the Wonderlick and Bob publishes the Wonderlick scores of these players this time of year. Everybody usually loses their minds. How can you do this? And over time, the scores do bear out to a degree. You do see, not all the time, but it's, I guess, you know what, let me backtrack. The best way to put the Wonderlick, the S2, it's a piece of the puzzle, right? It's like a 40-yard dash. It's like a pro day. It's, it's part of the equation, the larger equation that every team at the top of the draft is using when, when they're making the decision that's going to be the difference between championships and pink slips. I mean, you cannot underestimate who you choose at quarterback, who you pick at the top of a draft. When you have that opportunity, it's everything. You're either going to choose the right guy, get extensions, win division titles, conference championships, Super Bowls, your legacy's entrenched, millions of dollars for all, promotions all around. You choose the wrong guy, you could be out of a job in a year. We live here in Buffalo. Everybody wanted Josh Rosen. They choose Josh Allen. The trajectory of the Buffalo Bills goes a completely different direction if they choose Josh Rosen. So, yes, I get it. There are some folks that see Bob publish a Wonderlick score, an S2 score, and say, oh, how can you do that to the kid right on the eve of the draft? Look, this isn't this isn't Bob. Bob is connected to the NFL. This is a very real tool that is being used by teams as part of that equation to make sure they choose the right quarterback to their knowledge, best they can. It's The position is so much more than physical. The film is huge, and I'm sure we're going to get into it. I think it always comes back to the film. But you need to know mentally, you know, I guess there's two two buckets mentally, right? There's processing seeing the field, split-second decisions, and then there's you just got hit in the jaw in the fourth quarter and you hit the deck and you're down by a touchdown and you got to step up and there's a mental toughness factor. There's just so much that goes into it that there, and I should pull it up here. For people who don't know, here's uh, straight from Bob's story, golongtd.com, part three, the quarterbacks. Bob writes, the newest thing in judging athletes is S2 Cognition a business based in Nashville that has been marketing its product to NFL teams for about seven years. And in interviews with several football executives this month, S2 testing has developed a reputation so strong in the industry that it undoubtedly will affect to some degree how quarterbacks are drafted. Suffice it to say the candidacy for Alabama's Bryce Young as the top quarterback only was strengthened by his preeminent performance on the S2, whereas the draft stock of Ohio State CJ Stroud, possibly the number two prospect, took a hit. Quote, the S2 people will say, hey, guys, that graded high on this test don't always play well. Or, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. This is a, a club executive saying this. The S2 people will say, hey, guys that graded high on this test don't always play well, but we've never had somebody grade low and play well. Joe Burrow last year scored a 97%. It's, it's broken down into four sections, 94% on visual learning, 97% on instinct instinctive learning, 97% in impulse control, and 93% in improvisation. Um, So this S2 test is described by Matt Barrows of The Athletic as a specially designed gaming laptop and response pad that can record reactions in two milliseconds. It measures how players process and make split-second decisions. Quote, anticipating, reading, reacting, and adapting to the game are measurable skills the website offers. And this past year this year Bryce Young scored 98% higher than Joe Burrow CJ Stroud 
was at 18%, one eight. Other scores for this uh, this year's draft class, 96% for Fresno State's Jake Hayner, 93% for Kentucky's Will Levis. Brigham Young's Jaron Hall had 93% as well. Houston's Clayton Toon had 84%. Florida Rich, or I'm sorry, um, Florida's Anthony Richardson, 79%. Tennessee's Hendon Hooker, 46%. And then this was the quote that made the rounds from an executive in the NFL. Quote, Str- Stroud scored 18. That is like red alert, red alert. You can't take a guy like that. That is why I have Stroud as a bust. That, in conjunction with the fact, name one Ohio State quarterback that's ever done it in the league. So, and then on Bryce Young, the other end of the spectrum, um, another executive with a ton of NFL experience said, quote, the only guy play style wise I can compare Bryce Young to is Joe Burrow in his LSU year, which may be the greatest collegiate football season ever. Bryce is the best combination of poise, processing, instincts, toughness. This kid feels and sees so much. So, Jim, I think this is when you do start to see some separation at the top every year and it's becoming clear that Bryce Young is viewed in a much higher regard than CJ Stroud. Whereas I don't know, a few weeks ago, I think we all kind of assumed they're neck and neck. I mean, you're plugged in with the, the Vegas odds. I feel like Stroud was probably right there at number one for a while with Young and now there's separation. So how do you, so you've been the director of personnel with the bills scouting with the Eagles, the saints, I imagine you're all over the film. Your eyes have been on the field, what these players are doing on the field. How do you factor in this stuff and trying to figure out mentally how quickly a prospect, specifically a quarterback, can adapt to the NFL game, which is much faster. It's a totally different game. That's why so many players in college are dominant college quarterbacks, yet do nothing in the NFL. I mean, you've got to somehow figure out what is that difference and what is a tool that can help us figure out who gets it and who doesn't. So I think you summed it up very well by saying it's a part of the process, a tool to use. I don't know about this test. Like you said, it was seven years. That's about as long as I've been out. So that came in. So I don't know a lot about this test. I don't know what their baseline is. You're giving the borough percent. So they have some sort of baseline. It's really simple for me, for Stroud. If you liked him on tape, this will not affect him. If you did not like him, if you had concerns on tape, you could use this to strengthen your concerns. If you're trying to talk people out of in your draft room, out of drafting him because you didn't like the tape, you would use this as a way to help your argument. From what I watched of Stroud, Tyler, he looked good to me. He looked like a natural thrower of the football. I didn't study him enough to sit there and say I would take him one or two, all that. But he looked like a – he looked very talented to me. I hope – what I saw on tape and what I hear about this test, that would not change my mind on what I saw on tape. I wouldn't let this test do anything to change what I valued about Stroud. Um, but the hard part is every team's different. Every team we've done so many, Tyler, we would do so many studies on every test and really what mattered as far as does the wonder lick matter? Does it correlate? Um, we would do personality tests, you know, personality tests that the military would use. And we would sit there And we would read back what they would say about players on our team who now we had them, you know, so we know these players and we're reading what they said coming out of the draft. And we're trying to see if they were right, wrong. A lot of times they weren't even close. So I think you have to really each team has to do their homework on the value of the test itself. But then you have to stick to what you believe as a player. And let me say this, Tyler, every single team that has been interested in any quarterback for this draft, they have already done their work. They probably knew everything about these quarterbacks by February, latest March, as far as the mental part goes. They've done their in-person, you know, the combine in-person, the bringing them into the facility or going to the school. We did it during Mahomes, Trubisky, Deshaun Watson, Kaiser. 
Uh, we went and do, did Bryce Petty the one year I told you about. I mean, the mental is done. It is at nauseum how much they already know if they can learn or not. So I don't think this test would sway anybody that likes Stroud at all. That's I the do. point then, right? If you love CJ Stroud, if you watched him yep. in that final game, right, Georgia, you're playing – the best defense in the country. Right. And you love the fact that he looked a little more athletic, that he can move. God, the way he throws a football is so effortless. That, very well it, said. Really, it's, it looks like he came out of the womb and was just throwing Agreed. a football. Agreed. And then you see the 18. You know, he, he flunks yeah. this test. Yeah, that, they, the what, NFL what would that do for you? Us, yeah. It wouldn't sway you? Like, if you, if you loved him, it wouldn't sway you one bit. No, not unless there was hardcore evidence. And we would know that going into it. Like our the area scouts. Now, if the area scouts in the fall were telling you, hey, he struggles processing. And then you interview him and you had concerns. And then he gets the test score. Now you have your stamp. As far as it was scout, it was personal interview. Now the test, I'm good. I, I feel like I've done my, you know, all the work I need to do to know he can or can't learn what we need him to learn. I really believe that, Tyler. I don't think it should if, – if, if everything checked out, if you interviewed him and he, he, he was picking up your offense, you were really impressed with everything. You know, we, you know, we have those guys do the huddle. I mean, they call plays, break the, how they call the plays, call the cadence. Everything is done in those meetings. If you felt good about that and then all of a sudden you hear about the S2 score – I wouldn't. Even, I would tear it up, throw it out. I'd say, hey, we interviewed him. Our scout said he can learn. The coaches yeah. at Ohio State said he can learn, and we interviewed him, and he can learn. I would not let the S two affect it. He was so good that game against Georgia. I like how you said it. Just natural passer. Very natural. More than the S two, what I think would probably give teams pause is that the second part of that quote. Ohio State quarterbacks now and it's the, the the scheme is such that it's it's almost too good right it's almost like he had too much talent around him Qu- Quincy Avery made that point in the Anthony Richardson story a couple weeks ago where you know Bryce Young it, it it looks better because he didn't have as much talent around him like Mike Rodak pointed out right it's it's not typical Bama receivers Bama linemen Bama five stars everywhere he had to throw the team on his back in those games and visually it was entertaining. And you're seeing a quarterback make NFL type of plays where you have to, you know, escape from a free runner, get outside of the pocket, throw across your body, that kind of stuff that they didn't see the year prior with Bryce Young. You saw it. So that helped his stock where CJ Stroud, that first read, that second read, it's open almost every time. And he's getting the ball there. So you're going to fault him for not having to get to option number three, option number four within the offense. Um, Now, Quincy Aver, he made the point to say, look, this is, and he's, I get it. He's a private quarterback coach. He works with a lot of guys, but he's, he didn't work with any of these top quarterbacks. So he's pretty independent in uh, his analysis with all these quarterbacks. Um, He said in that offense, he knows for a fact that he did have to make the full field read. Like CJ Stroud did need to see the, the full field read, but, did he have to do it much this year? Not really. He just didn't need to. So do we dock him for that? Is that something that he innately does not possess? I, we don't know. So that's where, and now you throw the 18% on top of that. That's where it's going to take a team with some stones and the right infrastructure to know, okay, we believe in you. We think this is in you. Because you're going to have to do that stuff in the NFL. You will at some point, it, right? Yeah. The, 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 the physical stuff can only take you so far, and he's not even really an elite physical specimen. He's kind of above yeah. average across the board. He's no Anthony Richardson. So Anthony Richardson, he'll be able to run people over and run past people and throw it through a brick wall. He, he'll be able to do that stuff until he, he hopes, turns that corner mentally in his processing and where they're going to need C.J. Stroud to do that right away. Like they're going to need that out of Stroud right because he he's not going to be able to lean on an elite physical strength. So that's where I would be a little hesitant at the top of the draft. Uh, granted, 
what is it today? It's Here's, April twenty second, and it's Tyler. paralysis by analysis, and maybe no, we're all like overthinking you said, this. Now you said you would be hesitant. Would you be hesitant if you're the GM with no quarterback and you're picking second? You know, Steve Tasker made this point. I was listening to him on local radio here, and I get it. It's like, you know, the, the Bills show on WGR, but Steve will be honest, and he'll let her rip, and we've had him on the happy hour. I, I always love talking to, uh, to Steve Tasker because he said, look, at the top of a draft, all these teams – are putting these quarterbacks through all these different tests, mental stuff, physical stuff. And you may even have all of these concerns. You may even have all these red flags for a guy, but you got to pick somebody. He said, and he's right. You're going to have to take a quarterback. You have to, are you going to be that team that just never really picks a quarterback? And you're just kind of plodding along with whoever you can find in free agency or in the middle of the draft. Like you, you, I didn't say it. But, but, but it's not. But, but you, you do have to take a. You got to take a risk. It no happens. risk, get no biscuit. Exactly. Exactly. It happens. We were never in a position in my time in Buffalo to take a quarterback high. You know, right. we've talked about that. It just wasn't the. It wasn't our time. But when Buddy Nix and Doug Marone decided to take EJ Manuel, that is an example of they wanted to take a quarterback. Right. They wanted a quarterback. Now, that was what I say a little different because the red flag to everybody. If you are a talented quarterback, you're not getting out of the top five. You're going to get reached on like Josh Rosen. That tells you how desperate teams are for quarterbacks. You're going to reach. Yeah, That's why Richardson might go top five. By the way, Dan Orlovsky, we should get him on the show. Because he really disagrees with me. He thinks Richardson. I like Orlovsky when he breaks quarterbacks down. I know he does his work. Um, and I do. So I like listening to him talk quarterback play. Really football in general. He's, I think he's really well said, um, you know, well thought out. Um, but he likes Richardson. He, would, he, sees, he sees what you see in him. And, you know, that's, that's the beauty of this. And we're not going to know for a while. Hopefully, right. hey, hopefully we're still having this in – our rule in the NFL is three years. You should know quarterback probably a little sooner. You might have an idea, but that'd be fun if we could ever, you know, if we're still doing this pod, get Orlovsky on say, Hey, here was the Richardson. Here it is. See where he's at in two years. Um, so let's talk. Back to, yeah. Back to all that. No, I, I want to talk Richardson, but you, you studied film of, of Stroud. So yeah. what game did you watch? What did you see? Oh, I, I saw every throw that I was looking for that I didn't see when I watched Richardson. I saw the dropping the ball in between the corner and safety tight coverage on an out route that just when the sideline was used as a defender as well. And Stroud could zip it, zip it right in there. Arm strength looked fine. Throwing motion, fine. Athleticism, good. Like you said, everything looked good to me that I watched him. And all I did, in fact, I think I have it here. All I kept seeing was good throw after good throw after great throw, great throw. Like there wasn't any running around like, Rich, I have it in front of me. Richardson was scoring his points for me um, all on runs. Great run. On that one touchdown against LSU was – I mean, that was incredible. I mean, it was. I mean, he ran over – You said people. you weren't impressed with that run last time. Well, you said ah, anybody ahead, can do he that. He run through people. He did – that was not a run that everybody oh, could do. So I did give him Jim points. changing his tune already, folks. I hope people are noticing this. No, what I'm saying is he's terrible, but all his <laughs> points were on runs. <laughs> Like, that's what I'm trying to say. When I scored Stroud, all his points that I'm scoring all his two-point plays on were throws. First hey, Jim, you, you keep game. filibustering for us, for our live uh, crowd here, because I'm moving inside, and it's starting to rain. And I, I don't know if we have any awning experts out there. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you with something, like, no, so good. ridiculous. I, yeah, I, I our awning, um, the last time it, it, we had it out and it rained, it, like, ripped. And these things aren't cheap. And so Springville door tells us, you know, you can't leave your awning out when it rains because it will just rip. And I'm thinking, isn't that kind of the, a point for the awning? Mine's up. In case it's – right? Right, and I get it helps you from the sun, but from a light drizzle too, you should be able to have it out and not have it, have it torn out. to shreds. You should be able to have it out. Strange, right? Well, okay, well, it's it letting up right so now. So you're going to take it down right now? Well, 
it's starting to let up. So I'm sorry. Let's just keep going right here. No, if I'm I have good. to like hustle inside, that's why. You're good. And I'll filibuster. Um, but I was just saying, I really believe I saw enough out of Stroud just in that one game that I would be completely fascinated to study him more and more and more because I saw all the two point throws. I like how when I grade guys, it was it was one after the next in that game. So, and that was the Michigan game. Really, and that's a, that's a knock on Stroud, right? Oh, and two versus Michigan, Not they never me. lose against Michigan. And that's why people aren't studying it the way I study it. You can take those games any way you want. But if you're really studying the throws, get get the intercept interceptions happen, bad reads happen. I mean, that doesn't, you know, that can that's gonna happen every game for great quarterbacks. But the completions don't happen for all everybody. The, the throws he made and completed, some quarterbacks can't do. And that's the stuff that I like that would separate him from a Richardson who has the physical ability. For those who don't know, because we haven't talked about your system for a while yeah just one and two. briefly detail like how, how your quarterback grading works because well, this is way better than passer rating qbr completion percentage i mean how you grade quarterbacks i'm telling you we we really got to figure out a way to trade market because i think the the monus grading system is how no. we really differentiate the uh contenders from the pretenders no i like that i appreciate it it's been i've done it enough to know that it it is definitely works for the way i like to watch a quarterback especially with the time i have now in life um and i'd love to do it i wish i could do it full-time and study quarterbacks but i do believe in it and basically i tell everybody's different so there is some subjectivity to it but you give one point for what you consider a good throw and two points for a great throw Minus one for a throw you should have completed and missed. Minus two for an egregious interception. Just bad read, bad everything. Horrible throw, a missed touchdown. You can't miss touchdowns. Like the great ones don't miss touchdowns. I, we say it a lot. But when you're watching tape and you see a deep ball and, and miss it, you can't overlook that. Like that's a missed touchdown. That's six that, points are everything. Touchdowns are everything. Field goals lose games. Touchdowns win games. So I guess that's my whole thing with quarterbacks. You've got to strive you, for high, high, And you high. do it with runs too. And then runs you. Runs too. Because that's, here's where I caught on. When I started this system, when I realized I needed to value the runs was Lamar Jackson. And that's when I realized when I was grading Justin Fields, that he was being used, not in the same, they don't run the same, but his points were equating to what Lamar was doing with me because of the great runs, but where Lamar separated himself was he was adding more consistent good throws than Fields was. Fields wasn't scoring like Lamar, but when I looked at Fields' great plays, a lot of them were runs, same with Lamar, and that's what they were asking him to do like Baltimore was asking Lamar to do. So it's a great way for me to be able to say, wow, the Bears are asking Fields to do a lot, just like the Ravens are asking Lamar to do everything. This will be interesting. And then we see Fields struggle to stay healthy. And it's like, wow, if that's how you're going to use them, that's the risk. But then you take that number and you divide so by the number. You num- divide it by the number of attempts and rushes in a game. And you get your score and then you keep it, every, you know, you do it every week, every game. And really, and you'll see, it works for me. But it is a lot. It's, there's a lot to it. And you still have to be a good evaluator. Like, you may differ on what I consider a great that play, the touchdown throw that we watched Richardson together, that was yeah. a that was a great escape. It was a great escape, a very athletic escape. The throw was nothing. Oh, the Utah two point conversion. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking the escape. The escape is nuts. The escape, the escape was extremely athletic. That's a two pointer for me. I You're give giving it one, one. I'm guessing one for a really good escape. But that's why this grading is so spot on because it's it brings the human element into the analytics world where really I feel like you, all you need, you need that. It's a, it it's a human game and you need a scout's eye it. on it. And that's why it holds you account. And, and I give points for a drop pass on a good throw. You will get that point. You know, Which so, you wouldn't get it in a passer rating or a QBR, that kind of stuff. Correct. correct. Or if you, or if you throw a jump ball, like just a jump ball and great catch by the receiver could have been intercepted. 
you're not getting credit for that where you do in the stats. So did you, did you apply this to the Richardson and Stroud film so, work yes. that you did? Yeah. If Richardson was terrible. Stroud was outstanding. Like Stroud scores like a starting NFL quarterback. Richardson wasn't on the radar in two games. God. I, I had it right str- in front of me. I'm, I'm like the South Florida yeah. game. He had a minus two for an interception that was on him, Anthony Richardson. He had a minus two for an interception on the goal line. Terrible decision. Yeah, Favre had plenty of those. Fair enough. I guarantee you, <laughs> Favre had a lot of two point incredible throws. It is fun looking back at his Southern Miss days. I mean, that's what made Ron Wolf a legend, you know, a Hall of Famer. He identified special in Brett Favre, like way back then, and how he threw the team on his back against what Alabama, Florida State, um, and that's. I'm not saying Anthony Richard is, Richardson is is Brett Favre, but you can talk yourself into elements of if special. Like there's Tyler, plays, I'm there's with, moments. I'm with all this Anthony Richardson stuff, but the one thing I never understand is there was evidence of Brett Favre. There was evidence of Josh Allen. There was evidence of these guys making off the chart throws. Right. I haven't seen off the chart throws from Richardson. I see the big and fast and I see the arm. I see the beautiful spiral. It looks pretty. I need to see more than that. That's like I said, that's a fastball pitcher. Well, let's take a moment to pull up Anthony Richardson and Bob's quarterback part three here because it's it's fascinating to hear the scouts break down somebody we've talked about a ton on the podcast. And again, subscribe, go along, td.com to get Bob's entire series. It's worth it itself. Just a ton packed in here. And I, I won't read the entire Richardson breakdown. I'll just kind of rip off a few of the quotes from scouts, but it's a lot of what we're talking about. One scout, quote, think Michael Vick with a Brett Favre arm. He is the highest ceiling I've ever seen in a quarterback, even higher than Cam Newton. Cam was big and fast, but not as fast as this kid. Cam had a strong arm, but not as strong as the kid. If you hit on him, oh, my God, you're talking perennial Pro Bowl and all pro. But it's a big if. Are you going to be employed long enough to see it through? Which is a point that you've made. It's like, okay, if you if you add a project like this, the owner has to be on board, the GM coach, everybody has to know this is going to take a while. Like it's not just going to happen, which is hard in 2023 when everybody wants everything in an instant all the time in life. Unless you're the Arizona Cardinals, you're allowed to do you can take a quarterback every year and it doesn't matter. You can and keep your job. That's the only thing. You see Steve, Steve Kine was on Cowherd the other day. You see that? Yeah. yeah, I did. I, I, you know, I go way back with Steve. I've known Steve forever and, and I know he's battled with alcohol and I know he's going through some of that too, but you know, Hey, he had, I'm sure I haven't heard Steve all his interviews. I would hope, I would hope he's very um, appreciative of how many years he got in Arizona because some of us, some of us, lose our jobs in, in the NFL after quite possibly giving a team their best off season in the history of their franchise and yes. never get another sniff. So I just hope he's appreciative. Perfectly said. Micah Hyde, <laughs> Sorry, Jordan I, I Boyer, always have to get safety, that out. Like, Deion Dawkins, Tredavious White, Matt Milano, Zay Jones had a hell of a year for the Jaguars last season. Um, Not I too see bad. Nathan Peterman still bouncing around. I see – that Vallejo still bouncing around and, and still getting tryouts. And I'm not even saying those were great picks by us. They were correct picks as far as the value that they're still playing. Um, it's tough. It's tough when you see it. Like, I like Steve, but, man, Steve, you had a, you got a lot of chances. It's strange. It's an outlier. You, te- you but, usually don't see a GM. La- what was he, the GM for, like, 13 years? I think. That's insane. Steve Wilkes, Josh Rosen, no thank you. Kyler Murray, Queensberry, that didn't work. Now you finally, but that was just, that was like the last part. But, oh. but you know what? 
back to what you're saying though at the top, picking quarterback at the top. It like I said before, I don't know if it's my age now or I've been through it, but I don't have it in me for this unbelievable project that's going to happen, even though we've only seen a little glimpse of a, a fast, big quarterback run fast with a big arm. I just don't get how that equates to far of who we had. It. So he's at Southern Miss. Like, I like how – let's go back to that. That probably did benefit him. Like, to your point, they, they caught – everybody's attention that he was putting Southern Miss on his back. And I've looked up all his stats over his history in college. Cause I'm a huge far guy like you are. It's funny. He wasn't some dynamic passer in college. You know, he just, you saw the highlight throws because yeah. the arm was off the charts. Yeah. What he did, you saw his elite toughness and playmaking ability and running style and leadership to carry a team that wasn't as talented as other teams. So I, now that I look back on that, it, it's it kind of cool to see. But Ron Wolf, man, I always say, I'd like to ask him this more, but all these guys that saw this special player in Brett Favre, he had to trade for him. Now, he did trade for him. He went and got him. I'd like to talk to Atlanta because was it just the alcohol? Is that what Atlanta just says? It was the alcohol is why they gave up on him? Yeah, they didn't like how he was living off the field. Um, I mean, he didn't really take things seriously as a rookie. Because they made they the pick. Him and Jerry Glanville before the game, but you know, said, "Hey, can you throw it out of the stadium?" I mean, he they can mock and make fun of Brett Favre. It was just terrible from the get go. Third stringer, uh, but you know, Ron Wolf was with the New York Jets when Favre was drafted by Atlanta, and he that that's what's crazy about the New York Jets. There's just See, so I, many I moments. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Where they just missed, just missed on a Hall of Fame quarterback. Man, that, now they're going to get him next this week, we think, maybe, right? Right in the nick of time at age 39 when he doesn't really care much about playing football. Man, I tell you, I, it's to the point where I can't remember daily if he's retired or if he's on the Jets. Like, I, I every day I'm like, did he, is he officially on the Jets? We almost made it a full hour without talking about Aaron Rodgers. You snuck it's it close. in. Snuck yeah, it. I snuck it in. I snuck it in. All right, back to Anthony Richardson. I just want to read a few more of these uh, quotes from scouts. Uh, they compared him to, I mean, here is a hodgepodge for you. Vince Young, Colin Kaepernick, Josh Allen, Terrell Pryor, Justin Fields, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts. A few of the, a few of the comps there. Uh, this is a second scout. Quote, he's very raw still. He has to learn how to go through progressions. I was at his pro day. He put on a show and before at the combine. At his pro day, he didn't throw with the laces. The ball looked like a Nerf ball in his hand for how big his hand is, 10 and a half inches. He's a year or two away, but I think he has the highest ceiling of all of them. Richardson is more Cam Newton, but he throws the ball better. It's just his accuracy is off some. A third scout. Terrell Pryor was a tremendous athlete. That's actually not a bad comparison. I had Justin Fields rated higher coming out. I'm concerned that he hasn't played a lot of football and he hasn't done a lot of winning. Even in high school, they were kind of average. I have problems with his accuracy, 54.7%. He scares me. The accuracy scares me. A fourth scout. We don't love him, but he's talented. He hasn't played. Started one year and wasn't very good. If there's a dunk contest, he'd win. A fifth <laughs> scout. In a traditional NFL sense, you would say bust, but that you would say bust that he isn't going to have it from the mental part. He is the most cart before the quarterback, but if Steve, or if, but if Shane Steichen did what he did with Jalen hurts, then you've got to believe somebody out there thinks, okay, we can do something similar because this guy's more gifted. This guy's the most incredible prototype. He's the biggest, strongest candidate in the history of the NFL in today's NFL where there's enough of enough college stuff percolating upward, and we saw what happened with Hertz. There's at least a 50-50 shot that he can do it. And there's the case for Anthony Richardson. If the NFL is taking from the college game and just saying, Oh, that's what you do well, let's let's use it. Let's make that work. Now, there's got to be some ego involved. You got to believe that you can fix what ails that quarterback. I mean, and you're probably going to have to pull a trade like Philly did for A.J. Brown, right? There's a lot around Jalen Hurts that went right. But he was second-round pick, right? Late second. 
they saw because he was a second round pick. The guy was incredible in college football. Like I, I don't like we talked about this. Cam got Newton's benched. Been, got benched. He sure did, and handle that happens. Look who he yeah. got benched for. That guy, they're battling. They're both top 12, 13 quarterbacks in the NFL right now, the two of them. I mean, put him on another team that doesn't have like, that guy behind him. He's not getting benched. He I'm has the right mentality. He had a hell of a college football career. Jalen Hurts had a hell of a college football career. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not knocking him. I'm just no, saying that, 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 I, I, not, I see why he went in the like, second round. But to Philly's credit, they got to know him as a person, a leader. Uh, I saw the team put out like their combine interview with Jalen Hurts. I mean, you can just the body language, the way he's answering questions. It's so genuine. There is greatness to him. There's always been greatness to him Mm -hmm. back to high school. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what you have to find out because to the, one of the scouts points on Anthony Richardson, it's not like he was a high school phenom throwing the team on his back type of star. How is that possible? And he didn't even really win at Florida. Jalen Hurts did that stuff for his entire life. I don't know how that that's matters. possible that Richardson. I know he played. He played in Gainesville. I don't know. I I don't know all that high school football down there. But he, I, I have a tough time believing he couldn't carry a high school football team. <laughs> that that's straight. I'd have to look that up. We'll have to fact check that. Wildly compelling quarterback class this year. I would year. say. This one is good because it sound the more and more you talk through it, it sounds like it's Bryce Young. As far as you feel, every the check marks hit except for the size, but that's good. You can that's a to me you that's a yes. We can deal with the size or no. We don't want to deal with it. Everything else, there there could be there seems to be some serious kind of good debates. It reminds me in a sense of the Mahomes draft, and and, and that. That spring, nobody was talking about that draft as, holy hell, these two guys at the top are going to go one, two, can't miss quarterbacks. It just kind of snuck up on everybody. I mean, nobody, you're differentiating, you know, Mitchell Trubisky, like Richardson, had one good year college football at North Carolina. Um, Deshaun Watson was the highly decorated quarterback, similar to a, like a CJ Stroud. And, and from uh, I, hate, I hate throwing Holmes comparisons a around. College, just like C. what's C. that Stroud. from a horrible quarterback college, just like C.J. Stroud, Clemson, the Ohio State one. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, we'll get it. We'll get back. No, that's a great point. I mean, Clemson quarterbacks, the Clemson offense, that was a concern. And Bill O'Brien had that concern with Houston early in his career, right? They they really struggled figuring out what offense to use and didn't really want to embrace what made Deshaun Watson special originally and. How special has Deshaun Watson been without DeAndre Hopkins? I think very. I mean, the, the, his last year at Houston, he didn't have Hopkins, and he put up incredible numbers. They didn't. They didn't win. They didn't win. No, that's what I guess. My saying. He is a straight playmaker. You know, like Deshaun Watson is going to find a way to make. Now, what what we watched last year, he was that was. Woof, woof. I'm trying to get that out of my head still, but. Watson's playmaking ability transferred from Clemson to the NFL. The question marks on can he play in a traditional system? I don't know if we have answered that yet. I like that Cleveland roster a lot. I think Andrew Barry, I Glenn agree. Cook, that whole front office has done I agree. a tremendous job quietly. The sort of uh, meat and potatoes offseason that we're credited in Atlanta for – Cleveland did the same kind of stuff. I mean, Juan Thornhill, Dalvin Tomlinson, they, they, they found some players at positions of need. I mean, offensively, you know what you are. Nick Chubb, still in his prime. Maybe the best offensive line in football, top three. Uh, the team around Deshaun Watson's really good, and now he's there for a full offseason, going to be the starter week one. Just talking football stuff here, um, not the other if we tend to talk about Deshaun Watson. I mean, this this has got to be a big year for him. Like this. Well, Tyler, we'll consider what he's making. Like we, like we always do, breaking down teams. Owner, I don't I don't like him. GM and head coach, are they synced up? 
I don't know that. I think this head coach is on. I think he. This is a. I think he's on a little shaky ground right now. The head coach. So I'm not sure about that relationship, and I'm not sure about that quarterback. So the four things to me aren't quite stable yet. It, as we're talking about a team that should be, now that could change real quick if Deshaun Watson becomes the playmaker that he was in Houston. Now, now it changes. Now they become relevant. Can the owner stay out of the way? And is the coach good enough? Those are two big question marks. The way Deshaun Watson plays, it's so off of feel and second reaction. Like yeah. when he was at his best with Houston, there, there is a lot of magic outside of the pocket to his game where that, that was the concern, right? If you're just going to not play for three months, whatever it was, and then you just start playing in the middle of the season when everybody else has been playing all year. How do you calibrate to that play style? Um, you can't just, and it, and it showed he was rusty, uh, ugly, ugly, ugly football in Cleveland. Ugly, ugly. So they're going to need him. I mean, look at the AFC and the quarterbacks that you're dealing with the AFC. He's got to be special. And that's why they paid him all that money and took on the massive public relations hit that they did. I want to talk Cleveland definitely down the road some more. Any well, team that you want to hit on before we sign off? Because I think next week we'll probably get into Buffalo and maybe some Packers stuff. But anybody else that intrigues yeah, you into the draft? You're gonna. Well, I'm paying attention to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And which I was thinking about this was you were talking about Cleveland. I'm 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 a believer in the Steeler team a little bit. I thought they were hot at the end of the year last year. As far as when I say hot, they were a team that if they snuck in, they, they were getting healthy. Remember they, they went through a lot of injuries on defense and they were dealing with Pickett. a year now, a year later, they're going to be healthy on defense completely. The quarterback seemed pretty good for how the Steelers play. I still will not understand how they cannot throw the, until they start throwing the ball down the field. I'm never going to completely buy into this team. But as far as a team I think can make a jump that we haven't talked about that could give people problems, here's why the Steelers could give the AFC problems. They have the coach and the defense that can beat a great quarterback. And that's what they're going to need because they're not going to be – they're not going to – Pickett's never going to be, you know, Lamar, Josh Allen, Mahomes. We, he's not going to – Herbert even maybe. But can he be good enough for that team the way they play football and defense – special teams, all that the Pittsburgh does can pick it, elevate his game enough. And then Tomlin takes over with a defense, with a special player who you've done story on, but he's special. You know, he's as good as it gets in the NFL when he's healthy, he makes a difference. He was out last year. So yes, Pittsburgh is a team, I think in a division that I think, you know, when we talk the four things, Steelers ownership's good. GM and head coach are good. Quarterback's a question mark, but we like what we see. That's a team I see. See what I'm saying? I feel better about Pittsburgh than I do Cleveland. Just based off that right there. I like it. But, that's how, pick I, it. but that's how I do it. That's how I do it, Tyler. I, you know, that's, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's just my way of looking at those two teams. This is where you really do have to kind of look beyond the stats, too, because if you were to – I'm pulling it up right now. Kenny Pickett's final line, it really wasn't overly impressive. No. Where is it here? Yeah, he threw 12 starts, 2,404 yards, seven passing touchdowns, nine interceptions. Um, but then when you actually watch these Pittsburgh games, like with your own eyeballs, and he did he did go seven and five, but more specifically how he played late in games. The fourth quarter, like when, when, when the game was on the line, you know, the Raiders game comes to mind. Uh, Baltimore, he played – really well. He made difficult throws in pressure pack situations where you don't know how a quarterback, you know, bring a full circle with the draft. That's what you're trying to figure out. How are Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson, Will Levis, Hendon Hooker, how are all these quarterbacks going to react on third and eight, six and a half minutes left. You got to make this play. You got to lace this throw into a tight window and you've got to do it with conviction, with decisiveness, with confidence. And that was Quincy Avery's point. The, and he actually is Deshaun Watson's private quarterback 
coach too, and he's got Jalen Hurts, Justin Fields, works with so many of these guys. I think that's probably the trait you're looking for more than anything is just, and I know it sounds opaque and vague and confidence. What's confidence? It's, man, it's just being in that moment and believing in yourself and knowing I need to, I, I, I got to make this difficult throw on this play, but shit, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it. I've done all the work that goes into this throw and I'm going to step up into the pocket, deliver the ball, get hit. He, I, obviously, I love Baker Mayfield more than most. But Quincy said, he goes, honestly, he goes, I always thought Baker Mayfield was terrible. But he was confident as hell, and that took him a long ways. That won him a lot of games. That made him look like the guy for a while was his point. Uh, it matters. I mean, I think there's a lot of talented quarterbacks who just – are kind of meek and introverted and, and are maybe tense up in those moments to a degree. Kenny Pickett struck me as a confident as hell quarterback late in the season for a rookie. And now you're welcoming back the best player in football, as we proclaimed last year in TJ Watt, just an absolute game record. You don't, hear me, you don't hear me debate that when you say that. I, I don't debate it because it's, it's, it, he should be in that mix. I agree with you. And Mike Tomlin, he – I get it, defensive coach as your head coach comes he's with – He's a head coach. He's more than just line. a defensive coach. He's he's a head You're coach. You're right. Yeah, that's not fair. You're right. He's been around long enough where he's he – I'm just saying that – He doesn't the defense. He's never – I don't he think he's ever the, called the defense. Yeah, but he's just – he's not the, the this new wave of everybody looking for the sharp, innovative offensive oh, coordinator guy. That team is built – that that whole team has Tomlin – has steel, you know what I'm saying? That's they built that team together. Like that's that every player on that roster has been picked by Colbert, who's now stepped down. But the GM now, Omar, he's been there. And Tomlin, they know this team. Like they, they put this team together. I'm saying that like, he knows how to face these quarterbacks in a conference that's loaded, and you're going to need somebody on the defensive side of the ball that can somehow slow down. Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, in these moments, I I would probably trust Mike Tomlin more than any coach in the conference, more than Bill Belichick. Uh, And so if they can get going on offense, huge if. You're right. I I like that. I like that call for a sneaky contender. No, All right, Jim. Because Tyler, I also put a little futures bet that the Steelers make the playoffs <laughs> this year. So of course you do. That was my rationale. I convinced myself that they will make the playoffs this year. All right, what do I have to do today? NBA. I think I'm just going to throw it all on one team and win or lose, You're hot. withdraw and get the You're hell hot. out. I would say this. Tell me what, where's your take on the Miami Heat right now against Milwaukee? This is why I'm asking. I think we're giving I think this Milwaukee team's a lot better than Miami. A lot better. Now I know Giannis is I think even without Giannis, and they proved it the other night. I think this is just like we just said. I think there's certain teams that are just they're built, they're gonna make this run. Like th- this is what they do. Miami is being hung, they are one player. Jimmy Butler does whatever he can. Like yeah. watch any Miami game, you will be tired at the end of the game watching Jimmy Butler. That's how hard he plays. That's the wears, meme, right? Yes, everything. He just wears me out. I wouldn't want to play against him. Like it would be hard, and he will wear you down. That being said, I don't know if he has it in him to beat Milwaukee. So yeah, I'm thinking Milwaukee might be a team that we're. But I gotta tell you, Tyler, when it comes to the NBA playoffs, I wish everybody luck. I don't. That's not one of my favorite things to gamble on. Spreads five. Milwaukee's favored by five on the road here. Miami can't score, man. Yeah. No Tyler Hero either. He can he can score and he is not playing. All right, you convince me, Jim. Let's go. I, but I don't want to go. I just Bucks, told you. Baby. It's all on you. No, you gotta do your work. You're you've been picking well. <laughs> You probably hate those texts I send you late at night. It's like I'm trying to put the onus on you, so if I screw up, I can just blame you. All right, I, one of I those guys. Good. I feel like a veteran. I feel like the rookie's looking at the vet for a little advice. I like it. That's what it is, yeah. It's Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre. Oh, God. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, what, what's the what's the better analogy here? Maybe it's uh, you know, you're you're Rex Ryan. No, you're you're Greg Roman. I'm Matt Castle, right? Just just figuring this out together in training camp. I I compared us to two Hall of Famers. <laughs> hey, I'm your hand picked guy. I, you gave me a press conference. I'm the guy coming in, taking over. <laughs> All right, we better uh, we better cut our losses here, Jim. That was awesome. Thanks as always for everything Fun you bring to the up. podcast. Again, Fatty Beer Company. Make sure you load on up. Uh, Kenmore, Downtown Buffalo, Orchard Park, Hamburg, Tonawanda, Columbus, all over the place. And then Wednesday, six p.m. Eastern, we're gonna be at the Orchard Park location. So they're all over. We're gonna be at Orchard Park, North Buffalo Road, hanging out, talking draft. Hope to see you then. Thanks, everyone.